You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. You know, there are things that we get thrown in front of us suddenly that we just see or hear. Or I wish I didn't, you know, my problem is I just, I get on I-95 and as soon as I get on I-95, it's all happening. But it's sacred space. We all are sacred space. So this is a challenge to us as we read this to understand there's this specific set of standards that God's using to protect this area. And at the same time, Paul's going like, hey, believer, you're the same thing. You're sacred space too. In the world in which we live, Satan is our powerful foe. We can't see the fight that's always raging in the spiritual world. However, how can you be certain that you're protected from the enemy's attacks? Pastor Ken explains today why it's so important to keep your body free from addiction and sin. For you, the Holy Spirit is always engaged in war with the enemy. When you overcome your addictions, you make room for the Holy Spirit to work and defeat all plans through which the enemy intends to bring you down. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 41, as he begins his message, Sacred Space. We're in Ezekiel, chapter 41 and 42, and we're going to be talking about sacred space. We're still getting the tour of the temple complex by Jesus Christ, and it's really intriguing to me, and as we were talking just before, that there were guards, these guard stations there. Well, does Jesus really need guards? Well, no, not really. But he chooses to use us. He doesn't have to. He could impress upon everybody the need to accept Christ, but he chooses to use us, just like he's going to continue to choose to use us during the millennium and through eternity, which is really exciting because he's going to use a bunch of Levites to guard the facility. And are they guarding Jesus? No, they're keeping the, the people who do not have the requisite amount of holiness, the ones who don't really know the Lord, out. Because during the millennium there'll be those who don't know the Lord, believe it or not. Uh, the Bible even says that they'll die at a, young, at a young age of 100, considering them to be young kids at that age. That's something else when you stop and think about that. But we're talking about the temple complex, and we're still getting the tour, and so we're going to be talking about sacred space, the area specifically in the temple That is the throne room proper. This is where God, in the person of Jesus Christ, is going to be. Uh, In the temple, actually, in Israel, you had the Holy of Holies, and then the presence of God was over the mercy seat. But in this temple, it's not the presence of God. It's God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. So we've reached that section of Ezekiel where we're in the tour, and this is where Jesus will rule and reign, and he's the one giving the tour. By the way, we're all going to be able to be in this building that we're reading about. This is the Millennial Temple, and as believers in Christ, when we come, when he return with him to earth at the end of the tribulation, we're going to be ruling and reigning with him. The Bible says that, and we're going to be in and around this building. So it might be we might need to know a little bit about the lay of the land and what the building looks like. Otherwise, I, I hate going someplace where I've never been before. Now you can say, oh, I remember it. We talked about this. Now, remember the artist rendition? I put that in your notes so that you can see. This is kind of a, a, an artist taking these instructions that Ezekiel is being given and putting it down, showing us what it looks like. Uh, and remember the size of this thing. It is huge. It is about a little bit larger than the convention center in West Palm Beach. It's 50,000 square feet bigger. It's a large facility. And we'll find out that it's in the middle of an area that is for the temple area proper that is even bigger. Now the last two verses of chapter 40, and it's the, uh, and he brought me to the porch of the temple and measured each side pillar of the porch, five cubits on each side, and the width of the gate was three cubits on each side, the length of the porch was 20 cubits, and the width 11 cubits, and at the stairway by which it was ascended were columns belonging to the side pillars, one on each side. This is the vestibule, if you want to call it that, or in the Hebrew it's called the ulam. And we've already had the measurements of the entire courtyard. So we know what that outer courtyard is, we know how large it is, we know that it's about 400,000 square feet, a lot of, a lot of room in that courtyard. And it's thir- now we see that this additional courtyard is 34 feet wide. This is as you're entering into the, the, the courtroom central. 
It's 34 feet wide and about 20 feet long. So if there are people waiting to see Jesus, they think you can have a nice queue line there. You know, space like that, would, they'd go crazy at Disney with stuff like that. You know, that's a lot of room. The doorway itself to enter this area is 24 feet wide. This is what it looks like. Uh, so as you're coming in from the top, which is actually the east, that's the direction the door faces, you're entering the ulam, uh, the vestibule, whatever you want to call it. So it's 14, it's a big area. It is a large area, and it goes into uh, the hekal and then the dibur, if you want to look at the Hebrew terms for it. But let's take a look at verse 48 and 49. Uh, well, we already looked at that. We did that. Let's not read it again. We already read that. So as we see, however, though, from the... And, but this is different. This is, this is from the uh, Septuagint. I forgot I put that in there. So in the Septuagint, you actually see the terms Elam mentioned. And he led me into the Elam of the house, and he measured the doorpost of the Elam, five cubits in width on one side and five cubits on the other, and the width of the doorway, 14 cubits. But the reference is to Elam. So now we know that's, that, that's a direct translation from the Hebrew to the Greek to the English. So we know that's the term. As we see from the Septuagint, or the LXX, if you ever see LXX referenced in something, they're talking about the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible done around 250 B.C. by, they say 70 Greek scholars, Hebrew Greek scholars, but we don't know that for sure. But we obtain the number of steps. So if we go back, we didn't see the number of steps in our translation of the New American Standard, but here we see that there are uh, 10 steps, and they would ascend it on 10 steps. So we now know that there are three sets of facilities that, as you enter the temple. The first one you walk in, and it's seven steps. You climb up seven steps. So that gets you into the outer courtyard. And then you're entering into the next courtyard, and it's eight steps. And then you enter into this courtyard, which is the final area where the, the uh, throne room is, and it's ten steps. Now, each number means something. Now, seven is the divine number and the world number. It's also the number of completion. God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. So this actually speaks also of God's rest and the fact that the millennium, when this is happening, is the seventh day. A, year is a, a day is, is a thousand years for God, so it should be at, at that time period. One thousand years is, is a day to God. So this speaks of the millennial rest day. So you walk up the seven steps. The next is eight steps. That, and we talk, looked at that. Now the eighth day is the beginning of the new week. The Jewish Sabbath was on the last or the seventh day of the week. Jo Jesus rose on the eighth day. So you have eight steps. It's a time of rest, but it's also significant that it's pointing towards the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Eight steps. His introduction, his resurrection introduced, introduced a new order of things. This temple is sitting there in the plain where the Temple Mount is, and it's a new order of things. It's the millennium. Everything's new. God has recreated the earth at this point to be more in alignment with what it should have been at Eden. Ultimately, he is going to create an entirely new earth to make it like that. But this is, this is a fulfillment of his goal to bring heaven to earth and have us reside with God and, and serve and enjoy his presence. And he's recreating Eden on earth again. Again, the number eight talking about that. It's talking about the Christian Sabbath, the new creation, the regeneration of the soul. It all points to the new heaven and the new earth. And it talks about the eighth thing to happen after the millennium, which is the eternal state. So we have the seventh, which is the rest, the eighth, which points to all of those different things, going to a, an area that has ten steps. Ten is the number of completion, worldly completion. It's made up of the sum of the numbers of four and six. The number of man is in there, and the world number of four is in that. It's probably based on a system that's suggested by, I have this many fingers, ten, okay? Maybe. But it means complete, such as the Ten Commandments. And when you stop and you look at this, what is complete at this point? God's plan of salvation has been completed. He is on the throne. He's ruling and reigning. And the completion is by virtue of the fact that you no longer have the Ark of the Covenant with the presence of the Holy Spirit there. You have Jesus Christ in person there. So even the numbers of steps start showing us this is a different kind of facility. It's a different kind of place. It's not what we used to think when we start looking at 
the temple outline in the Old Testament earlier uh, in the uh, book of uh, First and Second uh, Samuel, and as well as First and Second Kings. Ezekiel 41, verses 1 to 2. So we, we go into the next steps here of this tour. Then he brought me to the nave, he's using some old terms here, and measured the side pillars, six cubits wide on each side was the width of the side pillar. The width of the entrance was ten cubits, and the sides of the entrance were five cubits on each side. And he measured the length of the nave, forty cubits, and the width of twenty cubits. Now, again, in Hebrew he's brought to the heckle, or hekal. If I say heckle, it sounds like I'm making fun of somebody, so we'll use hekal, okay? It's only the third time that Ezekiel has used this term. It's been used before when talking about the Temple of Solomon in chapter 8, verse 16. And it, what it means is, and it translates as temple 70 times, or palace, but what it really means is the, the temple or the palace of God. That's what this means. So when he's in, you're, we're entering into the Hekal, we're entering into the palace of God or the temple of God, the, the, his holy place. That's what this is all about. It, it can also mean a temple. And these are three other words that it may mean. A building considered as the house or dwelling place of God where God can be worshipped. Or nave, a main area within the building complex. Or palace, a large and stately residence affiliated with governing authorities or royalty. Who's in there? Jesus Christ. You think that's a governing authority? Yeah, the ruler of the entire universe. He's the king of the earth at this point. We're serving him. Is this the place where he should be? Authorities and ro where well, the royalty is at? Absolutely. No other place for him to be other than this. So as you can tell by the terms being used in the Hebrew, what we're being shown here by Jesus, who's the tour guide, is sacred space. This is space that will be physically occupied by God, by, by God in the person of Jesus Christ himself. This, he will occupy this space. And you notice as we've gone into this, Ezekiel walks into the first room, he walks into the second room. And if you start looking at the layout of the temple, of the holy place, you have a, an entryway, you have a main room, and then you have this curtain called the Holy of Holies. And on the other side of that is the Ark of the Covenant, and on top of that is the, the mercy seat that has two cherubim facing each other, and that's where God would be. And that's where they would do the sacrifices once a year after a lot of preparation. The only thing we're going to see in this particular structure is that piece of furniture is not there. You don't need it. The actual resident will be there. But Ezekiel has gone into the first two rooms, and as a priest, he can. Okay, He can actually go into these without any special preparation or anything like that, he can, he can go in and serve. Now, we've reviewed the security for this place, and there are only three entrances from the outside, and then only three entrances from the outer court to this inner court, and all have security. And the intent behind that is to keep the non-sacred thing out of sacred space. Now, this also brings some questions up when we start looking about what that means for us as believers. What is officially in residence in us? The Holy Spirit, okay? We're sacred space because God in the person of the Holy Spirit physically dwells inside of us. Now looking at this, look at the security to keep the non-sacred out of the sacred space. Now in 1 Corinthians 6 Paul kind of brings this up. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So we're having that described to us. And then Paul says, by the way, that's us too, as believers in Christ. Who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you're not your own. You've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So we're seeing all this security being set up to protect sacred space, right? In the temple, in this future building that we're all going to be going in and out of. We're actually absolutely authorized because that's our brother up there. We are adopted children. We belong to him. And he says that we're going to be with him forever. So, you know, I, we'll be able to go in and out pretty freely. We've got the special pass, but not everybody does. But when you stop and think about the security being set up for the sacred space, I have to ask this question. Since we're sacred space, what kind of security do we set up to keep that sacred? Do we have three entrances? Well, Possibly, if you consider my two ears and the eyes and my mouth, maybe, okay. Uh, but what do we do to protect our sacred space? 
Or do we just go about the day-by-day -day business and don't spend a lot of time protecting it? I think I'm probably guilty of not protecting it at that level. You know, there are things that we get thrown in front of us suddenly that we just see or hear or I wish I didn't, you know, my problem is I just, I get a 995 and as soon as I get a 995, it's all happening. But it's sacred space. We all are sacred space. So this is a challenge to us as we read this to understand there's this specific set of standards that God's using to protect this area. And at the same time, Paul's going like, <clears throat> hey, believer, you're the same thing. Your sacred space too. So do we set that security up? It's a challenge, isn't it? To do something like that. Do we take the same measures as the builder of the temple does to ensure that the non-sacred does not enter into sacred space? I gotta be honest, I don't do too well in that. We probably all have a problem with that from time to time. It's tough, but this is the challenge. God lives in us. We have to understand that. When we start talking about the unseen realm, there's warfare that goes on constantly in the unseen realm. There's spirit beings who don't want very much good for us. But Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit. He dwells inside us, and the Holy Spirit's basically saying, sorry, you can't touch him or her. Mine. That's the seal. So he's already set up the capability to have that sacred space protected, but then we do things to kind of go, yeah, come on in, Satan. Give me a hard time. We don't protect it the way we should. Titus chapter 3, verses 5 to 7, says this. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we've done in righteousness. In other words, there's nothing I've done to be saved. He did it all. But according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We have the Holy Spirit in us. He's living there. He isn't leaving. Unlike anybody else in the Scriptures, only New Testament church age believers are promised the presence of the Holy Spirit forever. We will never not have Him in us. He will always be with us. Always. The Old Testament saint does not have that promise. The tribulation saint does not have that promise, but we do. That's very precious when you stop and think about it. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 6 to 15. Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests continually entering the outer tabernacle perform the divine worship. Now we're talking about that final place. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Paul's writing this, that the temple's still standing. According, both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food and drink and various washing regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. That's why we can do what we're doing. That's why Jesus has taken care of it all for us. He entered in and opened up the door, and we even see in the New Testament that the veil is torn into from top to bottom. Not from bottom to top. God's the one who opened the door. Jesus is the reason, as we see here, that we're now considered sacred space. He did everything to make that happen for us. Nothing, nothing can separate us from him as a result of his work on the cross for us. I mean, if you ever feel like 
God's moved. No, he hasn't. We have. Because nothing can separate us from him, ever. Paul says that over and over and over again in the book of Romans. But again, do we have the same level of security around our sacred space as he's going to have around his sacred space in the future? That's the challenge for us. We have access to that sacred space that we're seeing here. God has access to our sacred space now, but who else have we unwittingly given access to over years? This is why we can't make any foothold for Satan at all, because that's an access that he's not entitled to, and he only takes advantage of it if you somehow open the door. This is why it's important to stay away from the occult, why it's important to stay away from things that are just kind of a slight invitation saying, yeah, I'm interested in this. Why does Satan give us a hard time on things when all of a sudden he realizes, how does anybody know that I did this? Satan sees that as an opening, and he's going to do everything he can to take advantage of that. That's what he does. Ephesians 4, verses 25 to 30. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Anybody achieve that yet? I'm working on it. I'm good at the be angry. Do not sin. I'm not so good at that. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. Did you see that? Do not give the devil an opportunity. He's looking for that crack in the door. He's looking for that opening into sacred space where he can start throwing in his darts. He can't get in, but he can throw in those thoughts, those ideas, those those things where you sit there, where did that come from? That's what he does. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so he'll have something to share with one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will not that it'll give grace to those who hear. Now here's something that just blows my mind. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed by the day, for the day of redemption. Did you know? That's a word that says it causes him pain. That you and I have the capacity to cause pain to the God of the universe who lives inside of us because we do something to violate the sacred space that he's established inside of us. Now all of a sudden I'm, wanna, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to get Claymore Mines. I'm going to send him up here, a little bit of concertina wire. You know, that doesn't work either. We still have to do business in the world, right? So that's kind of a tough thing for us. We have to be in the world, but not of the world. And that's what he's saying. That's what he's telling us to be here. We're not to give the devil an opportunity. When we give the devil an opportunity, we grieve the Holy Spirit. We cause him pain. He's still there. God is. He promises he'll never leave, but we've caused physical pain to the God of the universe. And until we repent, what can he do with us? Not a lot. I love the fact that he gives us 1 John 1, 9. This is the Christian bar of soap. I have that written on the side of my Bible. Therefore, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. The truth's not in us. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from how much unrighteousness? All. Not just a little bit. All. We have a tendency sometimes to go, Lord, I've blown it so bad. How can you ever forgive me? Just ask for it. Lord, forgive me. Okay, fine, done. Well, I don't understand, Lord. Go take a look at Romans 8, 28. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for the... Oh, okay, I get it. That's what he sang. We're so glad you tuned in to today's edition of The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken. For more information about this ministry and what we believe, You can find all you need to know at theunsafebible.com. Want to hear more messages from Ezekiel? We've got that too. Just look under the media tab. Again, our website is theunsafebible.com. As you've been listening to this teaching in Ezekiel, what are some of the things that come to mind? Do you struggle with unresolved sins in your life? Have you found yourself wondering why your life isn't going as planned? Can you imagine what it would be like to be exiled from paradise and to be told it was all your fault? That's the truth that Ezekiel had to deliver to the Jews from Babylon. It took 70 years 
but they finally accepted their sin as their own and returned in faith to God. Where are you on that journey? No matter what the circumstances are, you must seek God in all things to ensure a singular focus on the one true God. We want you to find strength in your faith. And if you need help or have questions, you can contact us directly at theunsafebible.com. Just click on the Connect tab and the Connect card. Fill it out and we'll get in touch with you. If you're in the Jupiter, Florida area, we want to invite you to our next worship service. Directions can be found on the About tab by clicking the word Contact. We hope to see you soon. Well, that's all the time we have for today. But we want to invite you back again next for more encouraging and uplifting messages by Pastor Ken right here on The Unsafe Bible.